the next speaker, who I will introduce before he comes up. <laughs> uh, John Byrne, also of Macquarie University. Uh, his uh, lecture this afternoon will be Drought, Famine, and the Nile, Adaptations Within the Nile Marshlands Ecosystem in Response to the Late Old Kingdom Climate Change. to remind you of some of the words of my friend Antifi. Remember that there were a time when people were dying of hunger, when men were eating their children, and the whole land had become like a grasshopper. Antifi held his province together, feeding the, the millions, while the rest of Egypt apparently suffered a severe famine. Science seems to suggest that about 4,200 years ago, Egypt experienced a number of worse than average flood events. And a large amount of scientific or sorry, investigations from a variety of sources and types all seem to agree that there was some change in the environment at this time. Some people have suggested that archaeological evidence also suggests that at the end of the Old Kingdom there was a change in the local environment. So that leads us to a sequence of events where the low floods led to a, long tr uh, a drought that eventually led to a famine and, according to many, the end of a strong centralised sort of local government. Now, my sort of study is based on these assumptions that art basically represents the society that produces it and the environment inf influences the society that makes the art. And so, therefore, somewhere in the art, we should see evidence of the conditions in which the society found itself. And my, con my investigation context, I suppose, is based around the river. The agricultural production is directly related to the amount of soil that the river produces. Within that environmental context, we have a cultural context. The high agricultural productivity basically allowed for the development and the expansion of civilization. So my, the hypothesis that I sort of started to play with was that apparently the Egyptians were reasonably well in tune with their environment. So if that's the case, they should have been aware of something was changing around them. And so therefore, somewhere in the decorations they produce, we should see some evidence of this. And so the vision I had was that somehow the archaeology and the science should agree with the decorations that are produced. So the three of them together should be able to give us a picture of Egypt at the time. And the aim of my project, a bit too long really, to assess within the evolution of tomb decorations changes that may suggest an increasing awareness of a changing environment. The time frame that I'm playing with is there, the red line rec oh, represents 4,200 years ago where science mostly says that was the nadir, the worst of the drought. Now, when I, my first degree was in environmental sciences and when we look for changes in environments or changes in um, situations, we look for patterns. And some of the patterns um, well, the way we looked for patterns was to measure the distribution of a substance or an organism, uh, how many or how much, and basically when that organism was present. So let's picture it. The distribution is talking about where they were. Abundance is how many were there. The most important aspect in eco ecological studies is the next one, succession. When were they there? And so the order of an organism or an object's sort of um, appearance allows us to develop patterns. So I wanted to do the same with the artwork. And I wanted to see if there was some succession in the, um, the, or some change or some pattern in the artworks that might be related to what I was looking for. And so within these three aspects, and over this period of time, I tried to look for patterns that stood out. I went to um, Harper's uh, 
Scene Details database, she has a record of a large number of Old Kingdom scenes. She's broken them down into 15 broad categories. And within those broad categories, there's 118 themes. And so what I did was set up a reasonably large um, spreadsheet where I went through her entire database and recorded every instance that she has nominated and I plotted according to um, the date she, she suggested. The Roman numeral represents the dynasty, the, uh, the Arabic numeral represents the king. So these are her 15 broad categories and you should see here a distinct change in the abundance of the scenes themselves. It's a bit hard to see. The summary is a little bit easy to understand. The reason why, I'm sorry, I, once I saw this sort of gap, I let the data decide when to do a change and the time of Nusra seemed to be the change to do a comparison before and after because the distribution and abundance of scenes seemed to change significantly then. And so I've done a quick summary. The four areas here are the only areas where the proportion of the decorations increased after the time of Nusra. One thing that surprised me is that desert hunt scenes did not increase in their proportion. There was more of them, but the overall proportion of the desert hunt scenes didn't change much at all. So the four scenes that I've identified are all related to food, either preparing, gathering, or um, organising. So basically, midway through the, the Fifth Dynasty, there seemed to be an increase in the distribution and abundance of scenes that emphasise the acquisition and the exploitation of food. It's supposed to be a drought, I've read that everywhere. Um, and so the thing that surprised me was the marshland scenes. Before New Isra, 28% of the decoration scenes were of marshland scenes. After his time, 33%. So that struck me as something that needs to be investigated. And so I chose the marshland scenes to start. I did a similar investigation by plotting the instances according to Harper of the, the, the scenes over the time. These are the 28 themes that she has broken down the marshland category into. There's the summary. It's a little bit big, but I've summarised the summary for you now. But basically, generally, there appears to be an increase in the distribution and the abundance of scenes that focus on the acquisition and exploitation of the marshland resources. Fishing and fouling, for example, um, 91 scenes from Dynasty 5 to Dynasty 6. All but two of them are dated to mid-Dynasty 5 and beyond. Only two before the time of New Isra. Hippopotamus hunting. Harper's identified 25 scenes, 24 of them occur after the time of um, New Isra, mid-Dynasty 5. The same with bird trapping, 22 out of 23. Workers placing the captured bird, uh, marsh birds in cages, 21 out of 22, all after the time of New Isra. Uh, 46 out of 48, the fish bearers, fish gutters, 33 out of 35, a large proportion dating from the time of New Isra and beyond. Dragnet and sea netting um, scenes, 78 out of 87. All of the scenes that depict angling occur after the time of New Isra. All of the scenes depicting fishing with a handheld net occur from mid-Dynasty 5 and on. All of the scenes depicting net making, repairing and drying occur after his time, his time and beyond. Fishing with a funnel trap, none of the scenes are there, or there's no scenes present before the time of New Isra. Fishing with a rounded basket trap, once again, all of the scenes occur post New Isra. Large net set from boats, it's only six, it's not very mathematically statistic, statistically impressive, but in the context of the others, it's worthwhile recording. So what have we seen? We've seen that, um, as well as marshland scenes increasing in proportion from mid-Dynasty 5 onwards, we've got to remind ourselves that this is when Egypt is experiencing a significant and a severe drought. And so we have the time of Nusra as the blue arrow, 150 years till the drought is thought to be its most severe. So I asked the question, why are we seeing this, or 
nobody answered me. I asked myself the question, why are we seeing this emphasis? And basically, I, su I suspect that there was some sort of uh, need for these new technologies, these new techniques. Did somehow the acquisition of food need to become more effective and more efficient? And so we ask ourselves, why, do, why have humans changed technology over time? An external pressure of some sort usually results in some sort of need, and that leads to adaptation and innovation. And so from that, I then had a look at just the fishing or the representations of fishing techniques and technology. And I looked for the, or the proportion of those before and after the time of Neusera. And of the, um, <coughs> sorry, the fishing and fouling scenes, 15% of, of the fishing technology scenes are fishing and fouling before Neusera. After it, it's more than a third. None before Neusera's time, but all of the scenes, 30% of them, are representing angling from boats. Handheld nets, once again, they're all after Neusera. Net making, once again, after Neusera. Fishing with a funnel trap, after Neusera. Fishing with a rounded basket trap, etc., after Neusera. Fishing with a large net set from boats, after Neusera. So these new scene types, you might notice, are very time intensive and they are full of small or they're small group type activities. They're not like the dragnet scenes. The only significant change in the numbers and the proportion are those representing dragnet scenes. 85% of the fishing scenes before Neusera were of dragnetting. After Neusera's time, less than a third were, only 29%. And so the question is, what is it about dragnetting that meant it became less important or less representative? Why did the apparent relative importance of the dragnetting scenes diminish? So we have 150 years before the end, or the, the drought is at its worst. We have this idea of some sort of external pressure causing a need to change or to adapt. And so what is it about a dragnetting that we need? A dragnet needs a clear bank to land the net, needs a large area of, clean, of clear water. A dragnet needs to have um, minimal obstructions and restrictions. And so there's something happen or sorry, there might be something happening that means drag netting is becoming less valid. So I went back to Ang Tifi and he, I remember him talking or complaining that he found the house of Hui inundated like a marsh and neglected by his keeper. You might remember that he got stuck, he couldn't get past certain parts of the river. And so I imagine that somehow the river seemed to have become choked up. And so I started to investigate the ecology of the marshlands themselves. What happens to the marshlands in drought? We talk about the land experiencing a drought. What happens to the river? So go back to sort of simple ecology. When there's a river, when there's a flood, the flood deposits the resources onto the adjacent land. So the land steals the nutrients from the river. When there's no flood, the river retains or keeps its nutrients. And so I went through um, literature fr um, from scientists who studied papyrus in Uganda and the south in the sort of the wetlands of Australia and America to look at what happens to um, plants of the same genus as papyrus when they're experiencing an excess of resources. So the more resources, the more nutrients there are, the more resources available, the more bio, bio sorry, the more biomass Let's, uh, I'll just, let's have a look at the ecology of the papyrus itself. So when there's a low or a slow river, we have less volume. Less volume means there's less power in the river. Less power means the erosion rates decline. So a slow river, though, experiences an increase in evaporation. The chemists who study the rivers overseas say that... Um, uh, sorry, the, I'll go here. That... A, a, a more evaporation produces a higher pH, or sorry, higher acidity, and also higher salinity. The third last point I missed, um, as the water slows down uh, and evaporates, a lot more secondary or sort of slow channels sort of develop as well. So these physical factors, well these factors, then have an impact on the physical factors of the river themselves. 
So the papyrus acts as like a flow disruptor. As it acts as a flow disruptor, it collects and harvests more floaties as they go by. The clumps get bigger. As the clumps get bigger, they become more of a disruption. I've already mentioned, I think, that papyrus seems to have a wider pH tolerance than a large number of other riverine plants. It also has been shown to have a higher salinity tolerance. So that leads to a series of factors that may affect the, um, the biomass in the river itself. Seeds survive easier. Why is that? The river's not as deep. The sunlight um, penetrates the same amount. The seeds don't uh, lose the darkness. They, don't, they receive the light they need to germinate. The seeds don't get battered or washed away. With less erosion, the rhizomes can grow easier and more extensively. As the papyrus clumps increase in size, a, a greater amount of habits or habitats develop, or a greater number of habitats develop. And as the habitats become more extensive, there's a greater variety within the habitats. And the food chain base increases, but more importantly, there's a greater amount of food web varieties that sort of develop. And so overall, it seems that as the river slows down, as the river weakens, the papyrus seems to actually like that. And you would expect that over a period of time of a slow, low river, that the biomass... <laughs> Sorry. It was after lunch. The biomass should grow in, in, a, in a spectacular and sort of extensive rate. And so, with the river experiencing a drought, the river seems to like the drought, I suspect. So the volume decreases, the flow decreases. And as the flow decreases, the papyrus increases. And so I'm wondering whether that, when we talk about the drought, we forget the river. And so the river did not experience the drought. The river retained all the resources that it carried. It didn't have its resources stolen by the land, as it usually does. So the resources that it kept may have helped the marshlands bloom. So as the deserts grew, so too did the marshlands. And so too did the marshlands or the resources that the marshlands could provide. And so you have the question, that if the resources available within the river increased during the time of drought, surely we can't talk about a catastrophic flood becoming more likely. So perhaps, perhaps there it is, do we need to look at other factors that might have influenced the collapse of the old kingdom. So can we truly say, as some people do, that the old kingdom collapsed just purely on environmental grounds? I think we need to take into consideration the increased resources that were available to the growing marshlands themselves. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I've got a few more.